Welcome to the first of four live talks that we are hosting as part of this year's Art of the Real Festival. Um, I'm Dennis Lim, Director of Programming for Film at Lincoln Center and one of the programmers of this year's festival. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank HBO for the support of Film at Lincoln Center's talks year-round and MUBI for their continued support of Art of the Real. Uh, we are in the seventh edition of this festival, which for obvious reasons is taking a virtual form this year. Um, so all 16 features and 11 shorts um, are available uh, via the Film at Lincoln Center uh, virtual cinema. Um, we are offering an all access pass, which I highly recommend as it's an excellent deal. Um, and I also wanted to make a note for um, those of you attending uh, the panel today, we have a special discount code. If you use uh, the code AOTR20, AOTR20, you get 20% off um, all tickets, uh, including the all access pass. Um, the festival is accessible throughout the US uh, this year. So um, I hope that um, there are people tuning in from all over. Um, and these talks that we're doing, um, as I mentioned, there'll be four of them. These are available throughout the world. So um, I hope that you'll be joining us from um, wherever you are. Um, so you, while we're you know, happy to have this increased accessibility, uh, thanks to going virtual this year, we are also very much missing the communal aspects of a film festival. Uh, so instead of recording individual Q and A's, we thought that we would over the course of the next week or so bring together um, several different groups of filmmakers to discuss their own work, to exchange ideas, and maybe to trace some common approaches um, or affinities. Um, the theme of um, this first talk is landscapes and power. Um, and I am delighted to be joined by five guests who I'm going to introduce now. Um, I, first of all, we have Joshua Bonetta, who is the director of the two sites. Thanks for joining us, Josh. Also, uh, we have Ernst Carroll and Veronica Kusumariati, who made Expedition content. Thank you to both of you. Special thank you to Veronica, who is in Bali, where it is three in the morning. So um, especially thankful <laughs> that you joined us. Um, and our two remaining guests uh, from Buenos Aires, um, Jonathan Perel, whose film is Corporate Accountability, and um, Ezekiel Yanko, who made La Vida and Commune. Thank you to all of you um, for being with us this afternoon. Um, Thank you. So these are, um, I think, four quite different films, but they, in sort of putting these groupings um, of talks together, we thought that um, these filmmakers, um, putting them in conversation with one another might allow us to consider this bigger idea of landscape in cinema, um, landscapes as bearers of meaning, um, as containers of history and memory, um, and also to think about the representation of place um, or of the idea of place. Um, the films have only been up for a day, so I, I would assume that many people um, who, are, who are joining us today have not necessarily seen them. So I think I'm just going to start today's talk with like um, four just brief mini Q&As with each of you, um, in which you can maybe just set the stage by telling us a little bit about um, the film that you made and perhaps just um, talk about it a little bit in relation to this idea of landscape um, and place. Um, Josh, maybe we'll start with, with you um, and the two sites. I think of, of the four films in, in today's grouping, it is maybe the one that closest fits the category of a landscape film, but, but I think it's also many, many other things. It's an intricate sound composition um, and it's a work of oral history too. So I'm wondering if you can just tell us about this place, first of all, the Outer Hebrides where you, where you, where you shot. Um, and this, how this film took shape, um, how you came to focus on the idea of the second site and how that informed um, the development of the film. Thank you for having me and thanks for inviting the film. Um, so the Outer Hebrides are a grouping of islands off the west coast of, of Scotland. It's kind of like the furthest west you can go um, from Scotland before you reach Canada. And the project itself, um, it started through a residency actually. So 
I did a residency at a place called Tai Kirsava, which is a, a Gaelic museum and art center on the island of North Uist. And, um, you know, it was quite, I applied with a, a project, several projects, but it was quite open in terms of, of you know, what I was going to make. It, one part of the project actually ended up as, as an installation there. Um, and the film, I really wanted to make a film directly about sound. Um, and that's kind of why I selected this, this place and this location. And the entire film, you know, initially started with sound recordings. So I was making sound recordings around uh, these islands. And I was really interested in the acoustic ecology of this place and how it was changing and how that was related to the oral history of the islands. And so as part of the recording process, um, and it was facilitated a lot by the museum. They were fantastic with doing this. They would put me in contact with folks and, you know, I would conduct interviews really about sound and they were really informal, just more conversational. And then at the end of the interview, because I was doing research into kind of uh, Gaelic uh, myth and history of the islands too, I was trying to find connections within those, um, those tales and stories that related to sound. And I had come across this, um, you know, uh, second sight, which I was familiar with second sight before a bit, um, but also this idea of second sound, there's a, 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 a sonic element to that where folks would hear things too. And, you know, that was almost like a second project. So I had these initial interviews with sound and then these interviews afterwards that were kind of more about um, oral history, second sight. And then during the editing process, um, I started to change out the interviews that were directly about sound with some of these interviews that were about second sight. You know, there's not every interview in the film is about second sight. A lot of them are about other things relating to sound as well. And that's how the film took shape. And you know, it's really the way that I work too. I don't work with something completely set out beforehand. It kind of emerges through the process of making and the encounter of being there. And it was quite organic in that way. And, the, and a lot of the interviews just fit with the materials. Like they, there, was not, there was nothing that was shot expressly to illustrate the interviews. It was, they went together in post. You described it, you said you, you, the, the initial idea was making a film about sound. And um, um, I think it's in the, the first, both the first and the last shot um, are of, I believe it's you, right? Um, setting up the microphone. Can you talk a little bit about deciding to bookend the film with those images? Yeah, well, it was me because it was like the, <laughs> the only person. You did, you did almost everything on the film. Get to, get to do that. I mean, anybody that I came in contact with or was friends with there ultimately ended up working on it in, in some way. Um, but yeah, I wanted to frame it uh, through sound and thinking about, you know, representation through sound, like, because it moves from something that is, you know, silent or, as or it's asynchronous. It has this interview going over it. And then we move into the kind of spatialized elements of it. So it's moving from something that's kind of more metaphoric or symbolic into something that's kind of more indexical to reality, spatial, these two different kinds of forms of representation in cinema. So I wanted to frame the work like that and end uh, the work like that. Um, you've um, also, I mean, worked with landscape in some of your other films. And I'm wondering if there were particular ideas about um, landscape and cinema that you were working through with this particular film? Yeah, I don't necessarily know if it was in relation to cinema. Like I definitely was thinking, you know, there's, I'm preoccupied, I think, in a lot of my works by how we encounter place and how that's framed by the histories and the narratives that reside in that place. And I think that that, for me, was one of the things I was most interested in the project and you know a lot of the inspiration in terms of thinking about landscape or place really more came through radio and sound works as opposed to to cinema but what i found out after i'd already got there you know there had been other films filmed there before directly dealing with that but that wasn't kind of on my mind when uh, you know i was making it and i i can i obviously you know it is a landscape film but it's um I don't know, in, in relation to the, the cinematic aspect, I think it was more kind of thinking about place through sound, which is maybe more diff difficult to think of framing in that sense. I think of landscape and cinema and painting and whatnot as something that's like a framed. And I feel with sound, it's a bit, bit more ambiguous or loose there. 
Yeah. Um, I wanted to mention to our attendees as well to uh, please feel free to use the chat function to submit questions um, to any of these uh, filmmakers or to the filmmakers um, as a group. Um, so um, maybe I'll, I'll move on to um, I'll move on to um, Ezekiel Yanko now, who uh, made *A Vida in Kamun*. And if you could maybe start by telling us about this region that we see in your film, and also this community that we meet that is part of this region of um, La Palma in the desert of Argentina. Um, I'm curious about your your interest in this region. I, I think it comes from your background as a historian. Yeah, yeah. The, the main idea was to uh, know about how the, this community uh, lives in the present. Um, uh, this is the, the main idea to move the project. Um, and this, uh, in these lands, uh, 200 years ago, uh, the army uh, killed the natives and took the lands. Um, uh, th that's the, the original question that how is living these people now? Um, I started to the research in this area in the north uh, of Argentina in San Luis and, and La Pampa. And this community is called Rangeles. And I have, I have a lot of trips there alone to, in, 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 uh, to, to different research. And when I discovered this special place, I, I think that uh, I have a uh, a movie there uh, uh, um, because uh, it's. Um, I think that the movie has two different landscapes. One is this uh, historical landscape uh, the, of the conquest of the desert. That's the process of, of the army killed the natives, uh, and the film evokes with the image this this historical process. But in the other, in their hand. Uh, this special place, it's a, a creation of, of the uh, government, of the province government, uh, creates a 24 tents, has a, a concrete tents, very modern, in the middle of nowhere. And these rankeles around the city moves to this place. And the, the interesting thing for me is uh, represent this kind of, because the, the space is very strange, uh, because it's a kind of a fiction of the old ways of life of Indian. It's a kind of misunderstand place created for the government. Um, uh, I, it, for me, uh, it was uh, in, interesting to uh, to put uh, to shoot this place uh, with these people. Uh, that's that's the, the the approach. Right. When was this community? Um created i mean you, you what you're describing are these sort of um these concrete structures these sort of modernist looking structures that sort of mimic um native dwellings um but that you mm -hmm. said it was a, something that the government did at a, at a certain point when, when was that mm -hmm. 10 years ago okay yeah it's a very recent creation and um, uh, the government created this place and uh, invite to the, 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 the natives to move there and live in community, but they are not living together before. Um, and an interesting thing there in this place is it's a mix between the modern life with the archaic uh, um, recreation of archaic uh, constructions. No? Right. Right. And, and can you talk a bit about maybe how this, as you, the, what you're describing, this sort of hybrid culture informs your hybrid approach in the film? I mean, you, you didn't simply make a documentary about this, but there's, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think, it, an introduction of this, of a fictional element, which is almost like a fable-like element in, in, in your film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, uh, the, the film is about the, the, the children in the, in the community, you know, I, I, I shot with only the children. Uh, I introduce a kind of fiction and, uh, or narrative elements to, to, to create a, a kind of narrative structure with a, uh, the story of a puma and hunting a puma. And for me, uh, it's a good way to uh, mix between the, the routine life of the children or the normal life of the children with this 
narrative structure that I uh, could create a little conflict between uh, the characters. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Good. Okay. Um, go to uh, Johnny, maybe we'll go to you next. Mm -hmm. um, and you can tell us a little bit about corporate accountability. Um, I, you think you can, in a way, describe this book, uh, this film as an, as an adaptation of sorts, of a book? Uh, um, of uh, an interpretation uh, um, of a book that was never published. Um, and I think like all your other work, this one has a very rigorous structure. Um, and maybe we can, you know, you can explain what a little bit about what this, what this book is and how you came up with the concept to, to give a sort of cinematic form to this, to this mm -hmm. book. Yes, sure. Well, I, I've never thought about the film as an adaptation, but it's, truly is an adaptation. Um, I, I've been dealing in my previous films with a space in relationship to dictatorship in Argentina for almost 10 years now. But it was always about the involvement of the militaries, what the militaries did and what the governments are doing with what the militaries did. But I wanted to make a film about uh, what the private companies did and how they helped the militaries in the repression of their own workers. This is a subject that it's very difficult to, to deal with in Argentina because it's, it's just easier to, to speak about what the militaries did and how they disappeared the workers. But to acknowledge that the private companies and very well-known companies uh, also helped, it's, a, it's a difficult. And I, I, I wanted to make a film about this, but I didn't know how to do it until I found this uh, book. The book is an official report written by the government of Argentina. It was uh, somehow released or made public in 2015. It's two books of uh, 600 pages each. And they describe uh, 25 companies that they chose which ones. It's not the only companies that help the militaries. But this idea that the book was written by the government for me was very important because it's not the film that it's choosing which companies to shoot or to to investigate or describe but it's a real uh, document made by, made by the government and then in 2015 the there were elections the government changed and the book was not forbidden but in a way, nobody knew about this book because it was never printed physically. You cannot go to a bookshop and, and buy the book. Uh, although it exists online in the, in the government uh, website of the Ministry of Justice. And for me, it was uh, very, very important that, and coming back to this idea of an adaptation, that the film shoots and contains all of the factories mentioned in the book. I couldn't afford to not be able to shoot one of them because I didn't want the film to, to make a selection. It, it has to be like the complete series of what the report was mentioning. So to be able to film, to shoot all of the locations, I needed to come up with a kind of a device or some idea of, of how to, to do it. And this is how I came to this uh, framing with the camera inside the car as a way of hiding the camera, because I didn't have authorization from the companies to do it. But also I believe the film is very honest with its, with its audience about how it was made, because it's not a hidden camera that you don't notice it's a hidden camera. It's very clear. You see the framing of the car, the, the, the car as a device, it's, it's what allows the film to, to be made. And also it creates a little tension. It was uh, also difficult for me to do it. Um, but it came out a, a, a good uh, device to, to make sure I could afford to, to shoot all of the companies mm -hmm. until the very last one. I remember it's uh, 32 shots in the film. And when I was doing the 32, I was very nervous if, if I couldn't do that last shot. Uh, I didn't have a film, you know, it's, it's impossible to, to complete the film without all of them. So I remember perfectly that night coming back to the hotel. It's a very long trip in Argentina that I did to, to make this film. Uh, it's a very big country, like 15,000 kilometers with my own car and 
like, like Joshua said, I do everything myself, the sound and the camera, everything alone. So I remember that night when I accomplished 32 factories, it was a very uh, a good relief, you know, that, that I had them all in my pocket, all in the can. Um, yeah, and, and coming back to this idea of uh, landscapes and how my films are about uh, disappear workers that are not there to be represented in any way. It's, it, it's uh, something that escapes representation in the most extreme way because these bodies that we don't know yet where they are. There's no grave, there's no place to bring flowers. So when there is nothing to shoot, the place, the landscape is there. And, and my, my main motive to make this film is that these uh, factories that I shot, they are still working, most of them. They're uh, fuming smoke from their chimneys, you know? So uh, this is the landscape that I wanted in the film. These factories working, throwing smoke uh, up in the sky. Yeah. You, you mentioned this, um, I think, very simple but very important device, which is that, you know, the, the, the camera is inside the car. Um, we always see, whatever we see is framed through the, 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 the windows, the windshield of the car. Um, I think that also gives it this almost like a stakeout feeling, like you're, like, like you're a detective sort of staking out this, you know, this, this corporation, this factory. Um, but the, the other device that we haven't mentioned is um, your recitation your reading of uh, from the book if you can talk a little bit about about that yeah. too yeah that that was not uh, totally clear from the beginning that it will be in the movie those uh, recordings of my voice were only recorded for myself because since the book does not exist in printing i wanted to read again all the parts when i was traveling to the places so i recorded myself reading the book to be heard when I was going to, the, to each of the factories. And it's a very simple recording. It's not meant to be in the film. It's, it's uh, not very formal or serious. It's uh, like with mistakes, it's myself uh, reading. And I'm only reading the highlighted parts of the book. So the film as an adaptation, it's like a, a resume, it's like a, 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 an abbreviation of the book, only like the important parts. Uh, so the sentences are cut and sometimes it's only words and you go from one sentence to the other without uh, good punctuation, you know. Uh, but in this case, it was really necessary because in, in all of my films, I make sure that uh, there is enough information to understand the film, but there is always, I would say, little information. In this film, contrary to, to the other ones, there is a lot of information, but this information was very important because even in Argentina, nobody knows what these very well-known companies and still running the, co the country, these companies, they are still running the country. Nobody knows uh, really what they did. So this information was uh, very important. And also that they all did the same, you know, the, 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 there was a system, the companies were writing the names in a list of the workers that uh, were going to be abducted, uh, kidnapped by the militaries. The companies were handing these lists to the militaries. They were giving vehicles to the militaries, uh, transforming spaces inside the factories as torture concentration camps inside the factories. And when you hear that each of the companies did almost exactly the same, this uh, this putting the series together, it's uh, very important that, that it, it was not one specific company doing this, but all together in, in a very congruent plan, you know. Um, so lastly, I will turn to uh, Ernst and Veronica for um, them to say a little bit about expedition content. Um, this is a um, an almost Imageless film. It is, uh, and uh, I think you've described it as an augmented sound work, um, and it's it's a work that you that um, draws on I think some thirty seven hours of tape from uh, a nineteen sixty one um, expedition known as the Harvard Peabody Expedition to what was then uh, Netherlands New Guinea and is now West Papua. So if you could maybe just tell us a little bit about how you came upon this 
this archive and chose to approach it this way. I mean, I should say that this idea of um, place and landscape, I mean, in your film, I think um, that comes across through, through sound. Um, and um, I'm just curious if, if you, this, I'd like to hear you talk about a little bit about just the process of working with this archives, the process of um, selecting uh, and guiding us through this material. Uh, well, we became aware of the archive in a slightly roundabout way. I mean, both of us used to be at Harvard. Uh, I was involved with the Film Studies Center there, which is founded by the co-founded by the uh, filmmaker Robert Gardner, who made the film Dead Birds and who organized the 1961 expedition. And um, after he passed away five years ago or so, um, his estate was wrapping up some projects and that he had in progress still. And one of them was to make short films from unused footage shot during the course of, over the course of the expedition. And so I was approached to um, help put some sound to these works that were in progress. And to do so, found out that there was a, that this archive existed and that had been recently digitized um, apparently it was donated to the Peabody Museum by um, Michael Rockefeller, who's the sound recordist on the expedition, by his surviving twin sister um, in only 2005 or 2006. And uh, then it had been digitized at the Indiana University Archi Archives of Traditional Music and uh, sits in the Peabody Museum. And uh, it was clear going through these recordings in order to think about, well, what could be useful to go along with some of these images that there was a lot going on just in the recordings themselves, regardless of thinking of them in relationship to images. Um, and uh, of course that's one of my special interests anyway, is to think about sound by itself and to experience, um, to have that experience of the ways that sounds recorded in place can be evocative or somehow cause a listener to recognize or use processes of unclear processes of signif sig signification to make meaning out of sound and in relationship to place. And uh, it seemed like this was fertile territory to explore that. And Veronica became involved and we made the piece. Uh, so I think that the importance of this recording for, for me personally uh, was uh, uh, first from the expedition itself. So it's, the, it's very important in anthropology. I'm an anthropologist, so it was an important expedition and it's um, during the, uh, the era of decolonization, uh, where uh, the U.S. broke uh, a transfer of, of European colony uh, to Indonesian colony right now. Uh, so the first and the second is the role of Michael Rockefeller, who is one of the richest, uh, the fourth generation member of very rich family, uh, Rockefeller family, who also has an investment in West Papua. But I think the interesting thing about this about this recording is also the historical um, the historical aspect of, of of the recording itself that we work with the sound archive and we want to we want to represent the, this as a as a sound piece. So initially we didn't put like any image at all, any subtitle, any anything, <laughs> um, because we wanted people like to immerse in this in this world, the world that. Michael Rockefeller created um, and that uh, we created out of his archive. Uh, but uh, I think late in 2019, when we had to edit for the Berlinale, we started to think about uh, putting some images uh, which are uh, which spoke to the to the sound itself. But uh, but I think we had we had clear, a clear idea early on that this will be a sound piece, not uh, you know a piece with a lot of images. Um, I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about just the just the principles of how you 
what you selected from this, you know, very large archive um, and how you organized it. Um, it is, there is a kind of structure to the, to, to, to the piece. I mean, you know, you've created scenes in, in a way, you know, which is, uh, uh, so I'm, there's a, a through line, a progression as well. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about just the process of selecting and organizing. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll start with that. Well, it's interesting maybe to think about it in terms of landscape or in relationship to landscape of these other films. Um, it's all, you know, it's, it's through, so there, there, there was only one, for the vast majority of the recordings were recorded by one recordist, Michael Rockefeller, a young, inexperienced um, person, you know, who's learned to use this equipment. But so everything is sort of through, in a way, very subjective in that it's like through this very specific handheld microphone. And we're always aware of the presence of the recordist. And But there's also at the same time, uh, he, as kind of comes through in the piece, he's very... Uh, it, the piece is in a way about the relationship between the members of the expedition and the place between them themselves and the place where they have sort of helicoptered into actually it was not a helicopter, but a, what is a DC uh, D nine. I don't remember the name of the airplane, but you actually hear an airplane at one point. Um, they've sort of dropped in to this place that's completely foreign to them. And uh, so sort of in extreme opposition to the sense of landscape that we get from these other films uh, here where landscape is about a very lived, immediate, inhabited, intimate presence. Like it becomes a lot, it becomes, even in Joni's, I think, where uh, it's, we're hearing something from the past and seeing something from the present. It's because of the, that, that, they're, that, they're, that it's alive now, that it's still happening right in this moment that gives power to this horrific past, you know, that, that becomes all part of the same present moment of the landscape. Um, in contrast, it seems to me that these sound recordings, though they're sort of subjective and we're feeling Michael's presence, there's a, there's a stark alienation, I think, always. Um, even as in some sections of the piece, we, we work through, you know, some of his, he's got these different categories of recordings, sounds of nature, occupational sounds. And as we work through some of the sounds of nature, um, which might be the closest to sort of landscape shots that we have, there's still, this, it seems to me, a sense of distance. That's not only because of the technology um, and the sound quality of the tape, but also just this feeling of alienation that's there. Uh, so from the 37 hours uh, of uh, recording, actually what we did the first time was to listen to all of them. And we have like a like Microsoft Excel file <laughs> uh, to, uh, to list all the, uh, the recording that are there. Uh, and actually, the, uh, so Harvard Peabody Expedition to Netherlands New Guinea uh, was very well documented. They produced a lot of like documentation. So we work with the archive, like with other form of archive, like cinema, of course, Dead Bird. We are, we were, I think we are in conversation with that film. We also read all the uh, written archive. Uh, but I think the most important thing is like that we, we work with the indigenous, um, the indigenous Papuan to, uh, to not only to translate, but to interpret like, what kind of material is that. Um, so I think that's very important in working with, the, with, the, with, with archive like Michael Rockefeller, uh, not only because it has a political significance, uh, but all our scientific, <laughs> scientific <laughs> significance. But, uh, but I think uh, something that goes beyond that. And I think that's why we, we want to experiment with sound because I think uh, with the visual, we kind of somehow like can expect what kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, reaction that they have. But this, with the sound, I think it has a very interesting like potential like, to think about experience, about being there, about being in a landscape. Um, so it's also of a way of knowing. I think in, in Michael Rockefeller case, I think he was so bound by his, his background, right? He, his Harvard graduate, he's so rich. He, he went to West Papua to, 
collect or together what what he called uh, primitive art, right? Uh, for the Museum of Primitive Art in New York. Uh, but in there, like he was, was struck cr- by- Created by his father. By his father. <laughs> uh, and he was struck, you know, like, he was struck because the landscape is not empty, right? So uh, the conception of landscape is usually like attached to this idea of, of you know, like colonial expansion, like I think similar mm-hmm. to the to the Argentinian case with uh, uh, La Vida Común. I think like this this conception that the landscape is there, just there to be discovered by white explorer. That's not happening, I think. Uh, and I think in, in the recording itself, like, I mean, the archive, we encounter so many like interesting things uh, that Michael Rockefeller actually like, try also to navigate like, what is his place in the, in the world that do not care at all about Rockefeller. <laughs> um, so, um, so we also back and forth between thinking about what the sound can do and what our uh, indigenous Papuan friend uh, tells us about what they think about this, this archive. Uh, so it's also seek the relationship or perspective from not from the not from Harvard where this uh, project started, but also from the Papuan themselves, uh, what they think about this archive. That's great. Um, thank you, all of you. Um, I think there's a lot. Uh, um, I'm wondering if any of you want to respond to anything that's been said. I think there's a lot of interesting ideas that, that emerged from all of you talking about uh, your own work. Or I can ask <laughs> another question as well. Um, I think one, Josh, did you, were you going to say something? Sorry. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so this is a question for uh, Veronica and Ernst. Um, I really uh, enjoyed your film so much. I, you know, not only found it provoking, but it was also really in- inspiring to see as a, a filmmaker. Um, just so many incredible ideas and really innovative in terms of its form. I'm just curious, I think I kind of have an idea why, but I would be interested in your thoughts, like why in the cinema form and not say radio or as a sound installation per se. And, you know, for me, it's like really interesting is like, could there be like a sound only cinema? Like, does it need image? Is that why there is that moment of image? Like you felt like you needed that in order to kind of put it into this realm? There, now it's a movie. <laughs> yeah. But Two I'm minutes. Curious your thoughts on that. Um, so, um, yeah. Can I just, I'll just say something briefly. So it's pretty simple, but yeah, yes, you can have, well, What's the author now? Uh, the four and a half Rick Altman or somebody Altman, four and a half film fallacies. This little essay, mm-hmm. where one of them is this ontological essay that that somehow or or, or uh, fallacy, ontological fallacy, where uh, you know the idea that image without sound is cinema, but somehow sound without image is not cinema. Not necessarily the case. Could be either way, etc. And uh, the 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 short answer is simply to take advantage. Well, there's a few things. Obviously, it's in relationship to dead birds. It's in relationship to cinema, the history of visual anthropology, at least, and you know maybe this kind of nonfiction cinema at large. But also just to take advantage of the built-in sound system of a cinema um, is a wonderful place for listening. And uh, in particular with this piece, um, we've got the left, center, and right speakers of the cinema, and these tapes, original tapes, are all in mono. So we're using the center speaker, sometimes the left speaker, sometimes the right speaker um, for a nice coherent mono sound, ideally. I mean, uh, apparently with the FilmLinks um, streaming system, if you have a Chromecast or uh, Apple TV, then you can hear these things in 5.1. So if you do have those things, you can hear our piece <laughs> with the left, center, right thing, because we made the piece that way. But uh, over you know, it works over headphones or, or normal speakers too, I think. But cinemas are a wonderful place for listening. Um, built in great sound systems that are kind of standardized to a certain extent. Johnny. 
Yeah, I have a little thing to add because I also always ask about my films why they are not a video installation in a museum mm -hmm. because they lack a narrative and I'm always received that comment for my films. And similar to, to what Ernst is saying, I'm always uh, thinking about my films to be watched in a cinema space, not only because of the quality, but also because the spectator, when, when they enter a cinema, they allow themselves for a, I don't know, like a deeper experience, you know? It's, it's harder to, to leave a cinema. And my films are quite uh, slow or very loose narration, but not because I want them to be boring, but because I want my films to construct, to build a space for the audience to get inside the film. And I believe that this can happen easily if in a cinema rather than in a museum environment where you can go in and out very easily. Exactly. It's not that I want to trap the audience, but I want them to immerse and, and allow themselves to, to a more silent, uh, immersive situation where they can collaborate and, and get uh, to occupy a place inside the film. So I'm always uh, thinking about uh, my films being watched in a cinema, although now it's uh, quite uh, difficult. But yeah. Yeah, this is making me sad that we're not showing all your films in, in cinema, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad to, uh, that all of you have had the experience of uh, premiering your films uh, earlier this year or last year um, in, in the cinema setting. Um, um, actually, maybe I can, I wonder if, if, if Josh, you want to talk a little bit more about how um, you, you compose the sound uh, for the two sites, because, you know, one thing that's, um, Ernst and Veronica talked quite a bit about this, but um, just this relationship between the visible and, 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 and the audible, um, and the idea, the phrase that, that Johnny used about, like, the things that escape representation, you know, and I think I'm, in your film, I'm really struck by this, um, this duality, this tension between like this, the, the sheer materiality of the, of the image and sound, and also just this, um, the spiritual, supernatural, like ineffable, you know, um, which is also like something that is very much um, a concern of the films. Yeah, well, in, in terms of the, the sound and the, the visuals, like I, I really think for me, like, the sounds are compositions um, and the cinematography I think of as like, uh, it's like visual notation. Um, and I think that that's just kind of maybe the way that I, my weird idiosyncratic way of working, but I also think it comes from like, you know, learning and beginning on film that, you know, analog film where it's double system, you know, and I don't necessarily shoot analog film cause I'm like a, a film fetishist. It just like, it hems me in. So I can only shoot a certain amount. And I think the, the parameters of that works really well in contrast to the sound, which you can just like keep recording forever. Like on this project, I moved from recording for like, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. By the end of it, I was recording for days. And then just like, you know, using spectral analysis and stuff to find stuff to the point now where I'm like, I've been recording, I'm working on one thing right now since I've been recording since March. So I think, you know, the, the visual element allows me to structure and compose it, but then I'm, I'm always capturing them separately because, you know, it's, again, you're doing these things at different times and it's not because I like want to do everything on my own. It's just, that's the only way I can make the work possible. So, um, you know, I'm collecting separately and then re resyncing afterwards, um, which I find quite enjoyable. Um, but it's like, you know, and there's not a lot of stuff that is, it was ever meant to be perfectly synced, but it's really images notation and then sound forward kind of compositions. And then they work together to help you find the, find the structure. Um, we have an audience question. Um, just a reminder to people um, to, if you would like to submit questions, uh, please use the chat function. Um, I think this is in relation to La Vida and Comun, uh, and it's from, um, Sebastian Castellanos, who wants to know about the region um, that the film is set in uh, and whether it's a region that's mostly ignored by Argentinian society or actively discriminated against. So I'm wondering if you can provide some, some context about that region. Okay, uh, the region is uh, San Luis, it's a province in okay. 
in the kind of the north in Argentina. Um, in this part, in, in San Luis, uh, La Pampa is um, this um, uh, a lot of community than than um, killed for the, the army to uh, hundred years ago, and this is a very particular and took the land for for the the elite for the government in that moment, and. and as Veronica said about the landscape empty, uh, the, the, this process is, is called uh, the conquest of the desert, but the desert is this place with, 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 with the indigenous people. And it's not an, em not an empty place, a real empty place. Um, and now uh, the question is if it's still the discrimination with the, the, the natives, that's the question. Yeah, whether the region is one that is just ignored by society or whether there's active discrimination against it. Yeah, the, um, I think that um, when I talk with them, with, with in that community, uh, the, 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 the old members of the community say that in the childhood, they're hiding uh, their, their past of Indian past and their, their, their or, origin. Uh, but now it's more... Uh, they can talk about uh, the origin, but I think that uh, they, they are still uh, are, are still a discriminated population in the margin of the society. And the problem is the land is still uh, uh, a problem with 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 the, the the natives don't have their own lands. Um, maybe. Uh, Johnny, maybe you can also provide a little bit of additional context for your film. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what's happened since the publication of this volume, or maybe since the since your film got, you know, some some play in Argentina. Has there been any kind of discussion? Because this was something you said this was produced by the Ministry of of Justice and Human Rights. So what what next? If, well, if uh, yeah, uh, so far not much. Um, I would expect uh, basically that, that justice continues investigating, you know, because in Argentina the militaries are being uh, trialed and many of them, most of them are in jail already, but there are very few uh, investigations and trials going on about these uh, private companies. There is one that was a very good example last year, which was a Ford Motor Company, because there was a sentence, and it was the first sentence where the managers of the company were found guilty. Uh, it was a very uh, uh, surprise and, and, and good example. Um, and there are a few others that have some trials going on very, very slowly, but it's a kind of ironic that the, the book is published by the Ministry of Justice, but justice is not doing a lot about this. And most of the companies that you see in the film are really very important business families from Argentina that they run the country. They, 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 are, they are also being presidents, you know, <laughs> last president. So yeah, I, uh, I, I would expect uh, justice for once, and also that the companies acknowledge their own accountability, their own guilt, you know, because they have to repair, even in terms of uh, symbolic repairments. For example, the files of the workers, they say they abandoned their workplace and they were fired because they abandoned. But they, don't, they didn't abandon, they were kidnapped and disappeared. And the companies knew about this because they hunted the lists. So. The reparation of these files, only in terms of symbolic reparation, it, it would be very important. But uh, to answer the question, nothing happened yet, but the film has not been shown in Argentina yet. Oh. Uh, I premiered in, in, in Berlin in, in February, and then the film went to uh, well, many festivals around the world. But in Argentina, the festival here was canceled. So nobody's has uh, very few people has uh, seen the film so far and it will have to wait until next April hopefully if the festival uh, is done to, to be released and let's see what what happens I'm, I'm looking into it and 
I, I know it will be a very uncomfortable film, but it's an uncomfortability that we have to deal with and, and discuss it, and it's, it's, it's out there. But yeah, it's, uh, let's see what, happen, what happens next. Um, Veronica and Ernst, I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, given your Harvard affiliations, whether you see this, um, your film as a kind of critique, as a kind of institutional critique perhaps, and, and I, I know the film hasn't shown in a Harvard setting yet, has it? Not yet. Um, yeah, I think you could call it institutional critique, sure. Not just, I mean, Veronica can speak more to this, but not just of Harvard, but... Um, sure. I mean, the Film Study Center, as you know, Dennis, is an important role in the history of this sort of, like, films that get featured in Art of the Real. <laughs> You know, yes, it's an essential critique of art of the real too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but you know, this you know, we purposefully use this term multimodal anthropology in the one of the opening credits. Actually, yeah, could you elaborate on that a bit? That term? Oh no, oh boy. <laughs> but uh, it's a it's a term that's being used a lot now. Like for example, um, so it's it's sort of purposefully a little uh, what's the word anachronistic to use this term and to say that this is what they were doing, because it's a relatively recent term, and recently used in the field of anthropology. It's an older term, multimodal. You know, it's just a term, but multimodal anthropology, the main journal of the of the triple of the American Association of Anthropologists, recently renamed their visual anthropology section as multimodal anthropology, and there are a lot of other connotations. Um, about what what it is it's not simply it doesn't simply mean multimedia or something like that there are a lot of other kind of connotations about what ideally multimodal would entail for example um, having it having a, a work being made not just because of the interests of the maker but because of mutual shared interests between the maker and you know a collaborative approach with the people who are also engaged in the making of, of a work, you know? Um, so shared interests, shared uh, accountability, and these kinds of things. Anyway, the sort of, so anachronistically using that term as a way to say, well, you know, look at the history of, the colonial history of this discipline and of this area, this way of working. Maybe Veronica might want to say more about that, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a, a look behind the curtain in a way, especially this last section of the of the piece, what we call the party scene. Yeah. Um, actually, I want to also hear more from other filmmakers, like Ezekiel as well, like uh, how to work with the like, indigenous, like the uh, the you know like the the continuing indigenous uh, presence, right? Uh, and um, I think in in our work. I think because maybe because I come from anthropology, I think I I have very critical take on on the discipline, and part of that is the the discipline of visual anthropology or the anthropology as a, anthropology as discipline itself is so driven by this uh, this uh, you know uh, uh, visual like visual imperative, right? So it's a colonial gaze. It's the gaze. <laughs> Um, is the case that's the the center of anthropological research, uh, even without camera. Um, so uh, we kind of like thinking about how if we shift away or move away from the case um, and see what we can do uh, with this uh, sound, uh, with this project. And I think in, on um, the party scene, of course, is an explicit reference to the then the New York scene and then the <laughs> Harvard scene, the elitism that comes with that, with the come with the with with kind of like scientific pretense of of, of representing others. Um, so it's kind of critic, uh, but also it's conversation. I think it's conversation with with the legacy of of, of Film Studies Center. I mean the uh, dead bird in particular, like with. We 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 are we are in conversation with with that film in a way that uh, we mimic some sort of like 
feel film language right we we use scene we use like uh, immersive film but but we also like want to challenge like certain tendencies in the in, in that part and in the visual anthropology in general um, yeah. um as a kill do you did you want to respond to some of what Veronica was saying. I mean, I mean, maybe one way is for you to, you know, to think about the the anthropological or the ethnographic aspects of, of your work and how you how you navigated that. Yeah, um, for me, the interesting thing is uh, create a kind of uh, 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 relationship with with them and uh, and and uh, and through and, and try to put um the the quotidian life the normal the tradition the the routines in re register that kind of things and through with them uh goes to the fiction uh sounds of, or the fiction areas or or, or create uh, uh, fables or different uh, uh, extend the material to the other uh, dimensions. Uh, uh, that that's my 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 my, and that, that, I don't know if I uh, this is an answer of your question or. or uh, if I could comment, I think like one thing that's also like striking from Joshua uh, work as well is the kind of like multi-species relationship that is shown through not only visual, but also like sound in the film, like the, the sound of the locals, the sound of the dogs. Um, I think it's very interesting in your work. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and for me, um, the, the, one of the idea of the film is that when you, uh, and in the relationship with the landscape, when you uh, um, the, the image of the real place, this kind of place, and the real people, you can evoke this uh, the past of the conquest of the desert, and and also the interesting thing is you could um, it's not it's a lot of times in in the space. The space has these different times, a co coexistence of times, because you have this past of the conquest of the desert. And also you have the presence of the, these people because they are, uh, they, they are living in this place that is a, a kind of mise-en-scene of a rural area with a kind of uh, uh, far away from the cities. But all the people there are uh, uh, arrived from the cities and they have a new experience. They have the experience of the Urban experience has uh, the girls, the women has uh, domestic works. Uh, the men uh, works in factories, and you have when you, when uh, you when you work with them, we, we work with uh, this past and present uh, experience. I think. So we are just about out of time, but uh, we have time for a concluding thought or burning question or anything from any of you? Um, I just am grateful to be in this group of, with, with all of you. These, their films are just uh, beautiful and uh, moving films. And uh, um, so thank you for including us. Great. Well, we we think it's a we're pretty happy with this lineup, um, and we we encourage you all to to check out these films um, as well as our other talks. Um, there'll be one tomorrow uh, on portraiture, um, and uh, there'll be two more next week. Um, the films are available um, in two batches. We're making the first the first batch is already on sale. The second batch will be on sale next Friday, um, and all the films are available for the entire two week duration of the festival. So we encourage you to see um, as much as you can, uh, and I want to thank all all five of you for this uh for joining us today this, um thank you for your films thank you for being part of the festival um i sorry we couldn't get together in person but uh next time hopefully thanks so much thank you thank, thank you thank you everyone take care bye
Thank you very much.